Welcome. Uh, my name is Gerald Newman, and I'm the director of the Human Rights Program here at Harvard Law School. Uh, and thank you for joining us uh, for this panel on fighting climate change with human rights law. Uh, over the past year, evidence of accelerating climate change has been piling up, uh, and so have warnings from the United Nations about the present and future consequences of insufficient action. Uh, we have also seen increasing efforts to characterize the resulting harms as human rights violations in terms of international human rights law or equivalent national guarantees of individual rights. Uh, there has been ongoing litigation in national courts and in international tribunals framed in human rights terms with important decisions in Germany, Belgium, and the Netherlands, and a group of decisions from the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child. The Committee on the Rights of the Child is the independent treaty body that monitors compliance with the most widely ratified human rights treaty in the world, the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Every UN member state except the United States has ratified the Convention on the Rights of the Child. There's a longstanding debate on whether environmental issues should be framed as human rights issues, what that might add and what that might obscure. And perhaps climate change is a special case and the answers are clearer here. We would like to speak today about the advantages and disadvantages of a rights approach to climate change and the advantages and disadvantages of the turn to litigation. Uh, we're fortunate to have an unusual concentration of expertise on this subject at the law school uh, this semester. Uh, the panelists will be speaking uh, in this order. Uh, first, Anne Orford, who is currently visiting professor of law and John Harvey Gregory lecturer on world organization uh, at Harvard. Uh, and she is a Melbourne Laureate Professor and Michael D. Kirby Chair of International Law at Melbourne Law School in Australia. Uh, second, uh, Benya Mesmour, uh, who is Professor of Law at the University of the Western Cape in South Africa. He is currently Eleanor Roosevelt Visiting Fellow with our Human Rights Program. He is a member and a former chair of the Committee on the Rights of the Child. Uh, and third, uh, Jody Freeman, uh, who is the Archibald Cox Professor of Law at Harvard and the director of its Environmental and Energy Law Program. Uh, and she is also an independent director on the board of ConocoPhillips, an oil and gas producer. Uh, I'd like to thank the co sponsors of this panel. Uh, the Emmett Environmental Law and Policy Clinic, the Environmental and Energy Law Program, the Harvard Law and International Development Society, uh, and the HLS Advocates uh, for Human Rights. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about Human Rights Program events and publications, uh, please sign up for the Human Rights Program email newsletter. Uh, information on how to sign up uh, will be available in the chat. Uh, while I'm speaking about Zoom, uh, let me add that we are looking forward to a question and answer period toward the end of uh, today's program. Uh, and please use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, to submit questions. Uh, and I will try to ask as many of them uh, as I can. Uh, so without more postponement, <laughs> Uh, let me get us really started uh, by handing the word first uh, to Professor Orford. Well, many thanks for that introduction and for the invitation to take part on this panel. I'm a generalist international lawyer, so my focus is going to be on where climate action through human rights litigation fits within the broader international legal landscape of climate change. And until recently, the main site for the development of international climate change law has been multilateral negotiations, largely under the auspices of the UN Framework Convention for, on Climate Change. 
And there's been a great deal of frustration with the slow pace of negotiation, particularly in relation to creating binding obligations for emissions reductions, holding polluters responsible for transboundary harm, or establishing liability regimes for loss and damage. And this is in fact the 50th anniversary of the 1972 Stockholm Declaration, one of the outcomes of the first global environmental law conference. And principle 22 of that declaration stated, states shall cooperate to develop further the international law regarding liability and compensation for the victims of pollution and other environmental damage caused by activities within the jurisdiction or control of states to areas beyond their jurisdiction. And interestingly, back in 1972, there was a great deal of support for a much stronger statement on responsibility and liability for transboundary harm, supported by a range of states, Australia, Canada, China, represented by the PRC for almost the first time, Brazil and so on. But there was um, a more conservative view on liability that prevailed and really has continued to prevail for the next 50 years. So the results of climate negotiations have been more modest than many would like, and this is becoming increasingly clear as we receive more alarming scientific reports, uh, a growing experience worldwide of extreme weather events, and also a rise in climate protests, school strikes, and other actions. So for many, the slow pace of these negotiations and the lowest common denominator model of consensus decision-making and negotiating is not leading to effective action and there's a need to look elsewhere. And we can see a similar dissatisfaction with the lack of binding commitments on corporate responsibility with the key touch touchstone to date here being the UN guiding principles on business and human rights themselves based on voluntariness. So in that context, we've seen a broad turn to climate litigation and my colleague at Melbourne Law School, Jackie Peel, has done a lot of work on this, particularly in the aftermath of the 2015 Paris Agreement and then the subsequent abandonment of that agreement by the Trump administration. There is a real surge in climate litigation. There are many places now tracking this and there have been around 2000 cases currently ongoing or concluded. So these include a number a growing number of cases at the national and regional levels, often brought under forms of tort law, consumer law, administrative law, constitutional law, but we're now beginning to see some that make reference to human rights law. And we are also seeing cases before international human rights bodies. It's worth noting that there's also been a counter trend in litigation at the national and international levels from fossil fuel companies and investors seeking to prevent fossil fuel regulation or compensation for stranded assets. And I'll return to that at the end. So we might say that treaty negotiations have effectively outsourced this question of liability, handed it back to the courts, and in, the ter in terms of international law, handed it back to general rules of international law relating to responsibility, to attribution, to transboundary harm, as well as to human rights. So I'd say then we should think of this turn to rights litigation as a subset of a broader field of climate litigation and again, international human rights law as a subset of rights litigation. Many cases involve constitutional rights, particularly in the global south where uh, economic and social rights are included within many constitutions. I'm just gonna focus on international human rights uh, moves here. There were initially many cautions uh, against human rights as the right venue for climate litigation, including issues related to individualism, to standing, to the question of jurisdiction, and also the competence of human rights bodies in terms of scientific expertise. And human rights lawyers also expressed concern about strategic issues, whether this would politicize treaty bodies. And on the other hand, climate activists in turn were concerned that raising uh, litigation cases, human rights cases could interfere with negotiations. However, many of those concerns have become less pressing. The cases are in large part being brought by groups and are very often future oriented. So there's less of an individualist focus emerging. The progress in attribution science is making the scientific question far clearer. 
And the dissatisfaction with negotiations is leaving activists much less worried about interfering with some kind of negotiations that are proceeding at pace. So we've seen a real rights turn, both at the international level and in the use of human rights domestically. There are a number of key touchstones that I'll just mention in passing. One is an advisory opinion of 2017 of the Inter-American Court of Human Rights on the environment and human rights. And I think the key point to note here is the concept of jurisdiction that the advisory opinion adopted. So they're saying that the court had jurisdiction uh, to hear cases uh, in which a state exercises authority or effective control over an individual, either within or outside its territory, uh, that being the standard definition of jurisdiction, so that individuals whose rights have been violated owing to transboundary harm are subject to the jurisdiction of the state of origin of the harm because that state exercises effective control over activities carried out in its territory or under its jurisdiction. We've also seen the Human Rights Committee in its general comment on the right to life discuss the duty to protect individuals from reasonably foreseeable threats and the inclusion of climate change as one of those pressing threats. We've seen the Human Rights Committee in the case of Te Aotearoa and New Zealand uh, reject an application brought by the Nas National of Kiribati uh, who claimed that the rejection of refugee status by New Zealand on the basis uh, uh, posed a threat to his right to life. Nonetheless, in rejecting that claim, the committee nonetheless made a, a number of statements that activists have seen as useful and relevant, and we can come back to that in question time if there's interest. And Sachi in Argentina, which I'll leave Benyam to discuss, uh, being the case resulting from a communication brought by 16 children, including most famously Greta Thunberg, relating to breaches of obligations under the conventions on the rights of the child. There's also been a number of cases brought in domestic, domestic courts uh, appealing to international human rights law. And the two that receive a great deal of attention are two uh, involving the Netherlands. One was the Agenda Foundation case brought against uh, the Netherlands in which the Supreme Court upheld a claim by the Agenda Foundation and NGO and some 900 citizens against the Netherlands ordering the state to reduce its greenhouse gas emissions by at least 25% by 2020, 2030. The point being to note here is that it relied upon a claim that the Netherlands had failed to comply with its obligations under the European Convention. And more recently, the case brought by the Friends of the Earth against Royal Dutch Shell, uh, in which Shell was ordered to reduce its overall emissions including those from fossil fuels by net 40% by the end of 2030. And here the court uh, drew on the guiding principles on business and human rights, as well as the European uh, Convention on Human Rights in interpreting the duty of care owed by Shell under the Dutch tort law. So there's much more to say obviously about this trend, but let me conclude by answering the question I was asked to give some kind of firm response to, is this a good thing or a bad thing? So there were, as I've said, a range of concerns that it was a bad thing because of a lack of fit or competence in relation to human rights. I'm not worried about that. I think it's true that climate change doesn't fit neatly with human rights law, but it doesn't fit neatly with any area of law. So climate change litigation is going to challenge lawyers and traditional legal frameworks across the board. And that's because existing legal regimes, particularly in market economies, are largely not designed around precaution or prevention. In addition, the scope and the scale of climate change and the potential loss and damage it will cause will necessarily test and disrupt conventional ideas about standing, jurisdiction, causality and responsibility. And it's going to be messy because our legal frameworks were developed in a different context of natural and therefore political stability. And we didn't have to think about loss, damage and vulnerability on this scale. So I don't think that's a particular problem, except it's a problem for all of us. 
I don't think these negotiations, these uh, cases are going to lead to a liability regime on their own. I think that will require negotiation. I do worry that lifting contested questions of distribution out of domestic or indeed international political processes and into the domain of expert adjudication can pro pose problems. And this is particularly striking here because of another domain in which these questions are being litigated, and that is the realm of investor state dispute settlement. And in this realm, the rights of investors are powerfully protected and awards can be enforced domestically. And to give a clear example of why this is a problem, many see the litigation I just mentioned in the Netherlands as a success story. And yet in late 2021, two energy charter treaty disputes were filed by foreign investors against the Netherlands, challenging its new law to phase out coal by 2030. And both those claims are reported to be above US 1 billion. Fossil fuel investors are major users of this ISDS regime and many lawyers and activists anticipate there'll be a wave of similar claims. So I think that lifting these disputes out of the political process and into the realm of international adjudication is something we perhaps need to think more closely about. Is it a good thing? I think it is in these ways. First, these are in a sense, very much strategic forms of litigation that will put pressure back on negotiators. They are also being brought by very savvy political actors, NGOs, who don't see adjudication as an end in itself, but understand it as having this kind of role. It also is giving, uh, addressing questions of representation and voice, in particular in relation to young people. And these claims are increasingly being brought as well on the basis of non-discrimination. So they are in fact an interesting experiment in moving away from an individualist approach and also opening up distributive questions around burden sharing. So I think we need to focus on this negotiation as part of a broader field in that sense, to the extent that states have been failing to address these questions adequately. This is one way of recasting the debate as one of justice and equity. Thank you, uh, Professor Mesmore. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, uh, just a very brief disclaimer from my side. Uh, I'm not um, making this input representing the Committee on the Rights of the Child, even though I had the great privilege of serving as the case reporter for this important case, uh, the Saatchi case. But before I get to the, the case, I just want to make a few points as a precursors. The first is that the Committee on the Rights of the Child didn't get on to the climate change conversation, and if you want to call it a bandwagon, uh, just recently. No, absolutely not. Um, we have had the opportunity to engage on environmental or related issues uh, in the past. Uh, in fact, uh, a general comment from 2013, for example, uh, on the right to the highest standard standard of health uh, provides that uh, states need to address climate change as an issue, uh, as this is one of the biggest threats to children's health and exacerbates health disparities, uh, and a number of other activities that we have undertaken uh, within the mandate that we have as a quasi-judicial uh, treaty body uh, has actually helped us to build uh, a bit of jurisprudence uh, on the topic. If one looks at the concrete observations that we have done uh, since 2008, that 2008 up to 2019, uh, one can see that 23% uh, of all states uh, reviewed by the committee uh, have actually received a recommendation, and that number is actually growing. Uh, it's not just only growing, uh, it's also becoming uh, more focused and more and more issues. For instance, the recommendations on climate change are not just only being given to uh, small island states, uh, but also countries that are not small island states. So taking the conversation beyond uh, the small island states, or uh, as some would call them, the usual suspects as being on the receiving uh, end. Uh, the focus has also evolved, not just only on the right to the highest attainable standard of health, uh, education and so forth, but also going into issues such as uh, international cooperation, uh, migration, uh, uh, even on, on, on financing uh, and so forth. So it has increased uh, in terms of the, the depths uh, that is being provided. In 2016, uh, we had a day of general discussion uh, that uh, focused on children's rights and the environment. 2018, the special rapporteur at that point in time uh, 
Professor John Knox uh, did a report to the Human Rights Council on, on the topic, and we had the opportunity to directly engage uh, in that process. Uh, and of course, uh, there were joint statements that have been issued in 2021, June. The Committee on the Rights of the Child actually decided to do a general comment on children's rights and the environment with a special focus on climate change. Now, these are important developments. Uh, they also, of course, help to take the case that I'm just going to uh, discuss in a moment uh, to a, help a whole new level because uh, the case is just focused on the countries that are the subject of the case. But general comments uh, would actually help to expand and even give us better opportunity to elucidate on uh, some of the critical issues uh, that are relevant and couldn't necessarily be addressed uh, in a specific communication that has been bef brought before the Committee on the Rights of the child. What I just mentioned is also an indication that we're not dealing with the subject matter as a committee in a, in a, in a, in a sort of a big bang approach, uh, but rather in a phased in approach, uh, even though the Committee on the Rights of the Child uh, is not the body that needs a reminder that uh, one year uh, in the life of a child uh, is actually 6% of his or her childhood. Uh, so the sense of urgency uh, is something we take into account in almost anything and everything that, that we deal with. Now, let me come to the case. This is uh, Sachi and others versus Argentina. Uh, that's how uh, it's been uh, summarized as short. But this is actually a case uh, that involved not just only Argentina, but Argentina, Brazil, France, Germany, uh, and Turkey. And the case, uh, as is known, uh, is brought by a group of 16 children. Uh, I know that the media likes to refer to it as the Greta Thunberg case in the UN, uh, but rest assured that there are 15 other children that are that are doing their own work, that are rolling up their sleeves uh, and actually engaging at the domestic but also regional international level to push the boundaries for the realization of children's rights in this particular case uh, in relation to climate change. Now, the petition was filed alleging that these countries, the five countries that I've mentioned, uh, they're not making, they, they are making insufficient cuts uh, to greenhouse gases uh, and failing to encourage the world's biggest emitters uh, to, cut, to, to curb uh, carbon pollution. So it's not just only what they were doing, but also what they were not doing in relation to other uh, uh, emitters. They asked the Committee on the Rights of the Child to declare uh, that the respondents actually violated uh, the children's rights by perpetuating climate change uh, and to recommend actions for the respondents to address uh, climate change mitigation and, and adaptation. Now, the, the provisions that they actually invoked range from uh, Article 6 on the right to life survival and development, 24 in, on health, uh, 30 uh, in, in relation to culture. But of course, at the heart of it uh, is the best interest of the child, uh, which is Article 3 of, uh, of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, they made three core requests to the committee. The first is to declare that climate change is a children's rights crisis. And I, there is no two ways about it. That's, that's a reality. The second is that the state's parties, along with other states, have caused and are perpetuating the climate crisis by knowingly acting in disregard of the available scientific evidence. Uh, and the third is that uh, they, as I mentioned, they wanted these rights, life, health, uh, and culture, uh, in conjunction with the best interest, uh, to also be uh, recognized. Now, they went on further to actually uh, elaborate uh, what they specifically wanted. So these were the three general requests that were made. But specifically, they wanted the states uh, to review their legislation when necessary, uh, to make amendments uh, in relation to mitigation and adaptation policy that they have in place, uh, to also initiate cooperative international action on the issue of climate change. Uh, and thirdly, and equally importantly, they brought on board the importance of child participation, that they need to engage with children and the whole notion of nothing about us without us is not just only from the disabled sector, it's also relevant for children's rights. And fortunately, the drafters of the convention, even though the convention did not benefit from children's input directly, were had the foresight to actually article to include Article 12 so that child participation uh, and the views of the child are given the necessary recognition as, uh, as a right. Now, the case actually benefited from third party interveners. Uh, the two former special reporters, uh, uh, Joe Knox and currently David Boyd, uh, they more or less made the argument uh, that was made uh, by, uh, by the petitioners. Uh, this argument revolved around uh, jurisdiction, admissibility, uh, international uh, co cooperation, uh, and so forth, so forth. The decision from the committee side in relation to jurisdiction, uh, we believe uh, is groundbreaking. Uh, we broadly accepted the author's uh, submissions, uh, 
uh, and dismissed those of the respondent states. And I will explain what these were. We highlighted three critical uh, elements. Now, the decision notes that the jurisprudence from the Human Rights Committee uh, and the European Court of Human Rights on extraterritorial jurisdiction uh, is important, but we actually felt that there needs to be a need to distinguish between what was already there in relation to jurisdiction and what we wanted to do uh, as the committee, because uh, we felt those were very different cases to the facts uh, and the circumstances of the case. So we gravitated quite a bit by making an argument that the current case that we were dealing with raises novel jurisdictional issues of transboundary harm related to climate change. Uh, and we relied quite a bit uh, in, from the, the advisory opinion of uh, the Inter-American Court on Human Rights uh, on the Environment and Human Rights, which actually clarified that persons whose rights have been violated uh, as a result of transboundary damage uh, are actually under the jurisdiction uh, of the state of origin. If there is, of course, a casual link between the act that originated in its territory uh, and the infringement uh, of the human rights of persons outside its territory. As you can imagine, all five states that were the subject of the case, they actually said that the committee doesn't have the jurisdiction, that, that you cannot make a casual link. Uh, and we felt as a committee that that jurisprudence that comes from the Inter-American Court uh, was strong enough. We also, uh, the, as a committee, we interpreted the causation requirement uh, as consisting of three distinct elements. The first one is that the state on whose territory the greenhouse gas emission originated must exercise effective control over the source of those emissions. It doesn't matter if it is government, it doesn't matter if it is business, if it doesn't matter if it is individuals, but that they have, uh, they have to exercise that control. And secondly, there needs to be a casual link between the acts or omissions of the state of origin and the negative impact on the rights of children located outside its territory. Because we know that extraterritorial jurisdiction is an exception. It needs to be defined in a relatively restrictive manner. Uh, and thirdly, the alleged harm suffered by the victims need to have been reasonably foreseeable. And uh, as a committee, uh, we elaborate a bit more that foreseeability established based on the author's uncontested argument uh, that each of the states uh, have known about the harmful effects uh, of its contribution to climate change for, for decades. Uh, and they've actually signed the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change in the Paris Agreement. Now, we, we, we went further uh, and cited that scientific evidence showing the impact of the cumulative effect of carbon emissions on the enjoyment of human rights, uh, including under uh, the convention. Now, the second and equally contested space is the exhaustion of local remedies. As you know, the, the committee, like any other treaty body, cannot be a first port of call. Uh, we deal with communications that come before us. Uh, uh, if exhaustion of local remedies has actually taken place and in a number of instances where it can actually benefit from the exceptions to exhaustion of local remedies. There was an argument that was made by the children, their lawyers, that pursuing the remedies at the domestic level would not actually offer them a reasonable prospect of success, that it would be, it would take too long because it involves a number of children from different uh, countries, uh, the possibility uh, of getting effective remedy is quite minimal. Uh, even points in relation to COVID uh, uh, might have been mentioned for, for the allegation of uh, un, un, unreasonably being delayed. In these circumstances, the practice of the committee is that the burden of proof actually shifts to the complainants. They didn't, they didn't deny the fact that they haven't tried to exhaust local remedies at the national level. What they explained is the reasons why they didn't actually exhaust those remedies. And from the, part, from the side of the state party, there were a number of arguments, relatively strong arguments that were made uh, that actually showed that uh, you know, remedies might have been available, that they should have been uh, exhausted, that there were similar cases uh, that were being decided at the national courts. Uh, you can talk about the decision from the German court, for instance, maybe a number of other examples uh, that can be highlighted. So as a committee, we felt that mere doubts or assumptions about the success or effectiveness uh, of remedies does not actually absolve the authors uh, from the, the exhaustion of local remedies criteria. And as I mentioned earlier, the burden actually shifts to them. And we didn't feel that the author's argument that pursuing domestic remedies would be unreasonably prolonged, uh, citing uh, a lack of specificity and substantiation. Let me make final closing remarks. The, complica the complexity of the case that we dealt with actually warranted oral hearings. This was the first case as the Committee on the Rights of the Child, we actually had to do oral hearings. For me, 
as a member, as a case reporter, the oral hearings were almost the make or break circumstance because you could actually put questions to those that are involved in the case and you can get clarifications and you can actually do a follow-up on them. This is the first case that we did oral hearings on uh, and we do believe that partly because of the complexity of climate change issues, uh, this was the right to, uh, case to, to, to start on. We ultimately wrote a letter when the decision came out uh, in a child-friendly manner, explaining to the children what the considerations were uh, and where from this point onwards. In a way, we're actually holding ourselves accountable. We believe in child participation. We believe in giving feedback when instance of child participation has taken place. Uh, and we believe that uh, that letter has actually contributed to empowering the children to a certain extent and making them aware what the reasonings were. The complainants, the, 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 the lawyers, they actually called it a hollow victory. Uh, but they still gave positive indications that they will actually now go to the national level uh, and try to explore uh, in terms of exhaustion of local remedies uh, to, to see how, if they can actually bring the cases back to the committee. We look forward to seeing that. As a quasi-judicial body, rules and regulations are important and we operate within those rules and regulations. One of the questions that have been asked was, were we worried as a committee that if we were actually to declare the case admissible, it would have negative effects on the in, in terms of the ratification of the optional protocol on a communications procedure. Absolutely not. There were no political considerations. There were no other extra considerations, but the rules and regulations that the committee was working with. Uh, finally, the case has actually helped us to push the boundaries, not just only at the international level, but also at the regional and hopefully at the national level. Uh, as a committee, we try to differentiate the distinction between an active committee uh, and an activist committee. And we don't really have the mandate uh, for the latter and we operated within the rules that have been provided as far as this case is concerned. Thank you and over to you. Thank you, uh, Professor Freeman. So I'm delighted to be here and to, to join this very distinguished panel. Thank you, Anne and Benya. I'm just wonderful to be participating with you. I am the least knowledgeable about human rights per se, but what I think I can bring is a little bit of perspective on trends in climate policy making and the different domains in which there are opportunities to force forward movement and to exert pressure. And I want to kind of associate myself with some of Anne's remarks, actually all of Anne's remarks, but in particular, her point about the legal success of these suits perhaps being differentiated from the political success of these suits. So I just want to spend one moment on this idea that while many of um, these lawsuits may ultimately not succeed, depending on the jurisdictions in which they're brought, depending on the very specific facts as Benyam recounted of the case and the jurisdiction of the adjudicative body, there may be many reasons why they don't move forward or don't succeed or are limited in the remedies that can be granted. And yet there may well be a political success um, in the sense that the lawyers behind these suits, the NGOs behind these suits, the youth activists behind these suits are really looking for a way to keep climate issues front and center covered by the media. They want a pressure point. And I really understand that strategic perspective as quite different from chances of legal success. And we should just be clear eyed about that. I would say it's not a surprise that these groundbreaking cases like the Jurgenda case you referred to and, uh, and the more recent Neubauer against Germany case, both really striking because essentially these are courts telling governments, uh, in one case, Netherlands, another case, Germany, they are not doing enough on climate change, either under existing law, say existing tort law, or usually informed, as you say, by human rights commitments they've made, or they're telling the governments they aren't living up to the commitments they've already made, say, under the Paris Agreement. That's quite striking and remarkable, but it's not a surprise. These are both in Europe. Um, I, I predict that if we were doing this in the United States, and I'll say something about this more in a moment, this would go nowhere. Um, it, it's not a surprise, for example, that we saw the lawsuit against Royal Dutch Shell, uh, the Milieu Defense versus Royal Dutch Shell case. This is not now holding a government accountable, right? It's holding a corporation, a major integrated oil company accountable. And here is a striking moment in which a district court, you know, orders a company uh, to improve and make its plan to reduce emissions more concrete. 
basically says your existing commitments to reduce your emissions aren't sufficient. And there are lots of reasons why it's not surprising this is a Dutch case against Royal Dutch Shell. Um, in a way, you know, I must say, in a way, Shell is among the integrated major oil companies probably doing the most to address concerns about climate change. And so there's a certain irony in finding it insufficient when there are many other actors uh, in the oil and gas space, not to mention national oil and gas companies um, that are doing much less. So all of this is to say, the immediate victories of these cases are quite striking, but I think their reach may be quite limited. Uh, and I think we can't expect to see a proliferation of successful lawsuits from this, uh, brought in this particular framework for, driven by human rights uh, concerns. But that doesn't mean they're not a very important political tool. And, and that I, I would expect to see them continue. I expect to see them as part of a much larger set of strategies to unlock motion on climate change. And I think, Anne, again, you spoke very well about frustration and a sense that governments aren't doing their jobs. And I think that's really where we are now. And, and I wanna make just a few remarks about the United States uh, in particular because as um, such a major actor in terms of both the GHG emissions now, although overtaken by China, still historically responsible for such a large share of the world's emissions, but also as a, a proclaimed leader of international climate negotiations with, with the intervening period of Donald Trump not quite uh, demonstrating US leadership, demonstrating the opposite. But from the Obama administration through now the Biden administration, the US has claimed uh, that it wants to lead international negotiations. And as you know, the Biden administration has um, reinforced and augmented its commitment to the Paris Agreement to 50 to 52% below um, uh, 2005 emissions by 2030. I say all this because I think it's important to see what these trends mean and whether they could take root in the United States. And my prediction there is no, and that litigation and especially human rights informed litigation would not gain traction in the US context. And I just wanna say a couple of words about why, and then I think it's probably gonna be useful for all of us to have a back and forth with the, our audience. Um, but the one case that was a youth mounted case against the United States government uh, in this country called the Juliana case, which many of you have heard of, um, asserted a bold constitutional claim that said there is a due process right in the United States Constitution essentially to a stable climate. And the remedy sought was a quite sweeping remedy, um, which first of all, the, the, the argument was based on, you know, there's a constitutional right and the government has known all along uh, that fossil fuels are harmful um, and that the fossil fuel economy is risky. And so the remedy sought is a court order to phase out fossil fuels. And this case was not successful uh, in the United States. And I think in it, there is a warning that we ought to be aware of as we have a broader discussion about rights-based litigation and, and in particular human rights informed uh, litigation. And that is that it's important to be strategic about where to bring these cases, the form in which to bring these cases, and what a bad result could do by way of spillover harms to future prospects of successful litigation. And so we ought to be aware of cases that have the potential to do harm. And I use the Juliana case as an example in the US context, because by asserting this constitutional right, and by claiming to have standing to get into federal court in the United States, and by requesting a sweeping remedy that basically says the court will order the United States government to phase out fossil fuels, the case had zero chance of success ultimately on the merits. And in fact, had it reached the United States Supreme Court, there was a lot of concern that our particular composition of this Supreme Court uh, would have potentially seen it as an opportunity to do great damage to the doctrine of standing because the remedy sought was so sweeping and so historically um, out of line with what 
um, federal courts have seen as within their authority to grant by way of remedy, a policy decision to order the US government to phase out fossil fuels. Ultimately, this did not reach Supreme Court. Ultimately, the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, this is a level of court in the US, of course, below the Supreme Court, um, uh, dismissed it, uh, ordered the Oregon court to dismiss it on standing grounds, finding that the remedy was beyond the authority of the court to grant. And I just wanna cite Juliana as a warning, not because we don't understand what inspired the case. It's, it's very similar to the cases Anne described and Benyam described, the, the, um, the youth activist cases that are motivated by a genuine and sincere concern about governments not doing enough. My worry is that the political impulse to launch this litigation needs to be matched by a kind of legal savvy about how to frame them for maximum success and how to frame them to avoid harms that may come to doctrine if courts and other adjudicative bodies that are hostile to these claims get hold of them. So that's just a sort of awareness strategic point uh, to make about this litigation. The final thing I'll say is that um, in the grand scheme of things, the question, is this good or bad, uh, can only be answered with yes. Uh, that is, uh, uh, there are beneficial uh, dimensions to this. Of course, when everybody's concerned about climate change and governments aren't doing enough and there aren't, there is not enough traction in the political system to force um, governments to make stronger commitments and to price carbon on a global scale and to enforce carbon uh, reduction limits and to perhaps incorporate uh, and use trade law together uh, with um, in international environmental uh, stat, uh, treaties. In other words, to, to find mechanisms for enforcement that are already around the international system. When there's reluctance to be creative about how to adopt and enforce and drive real change globally, of course, we are going to see litigation and the effort to enlist another set of institutions, the courts and international adjudicative bodies. I'm not surprised by that. And of course, there are real benefits. But there also are going to be some negative externalities of that, I think, unavoidably. So the answer to is it good or bad is both yes. Um, but I think all of us predict that we'll see more of this kind of litigation. Um, and whether it's successful or not, that is a hard question to answer in the abstract. It is part of a toolbox of strategies that is continuing to put pressure on all of the major actors. And to that extent, I think it is somewhat successful. Do I think that human rights based litigation in and of itself will drive the kind of change we are looking for? I don't think by itself it will do that. I think there are lots of other things going on that may help drive that change. I would just mention the institutional investment, the investment community, lenders, banks, shareholders, driving environmental social governance known as ESG uh, issues to the fore, forcing corporations to disclose climate related risk, requiring them to have sustainability plans. That in the last two years has become mainstream and enormously successful. And pressure from the investment and lending communities, pressure from the people who put capital into these companies can be equally or more successful than litigation holding them to account for liability. So I would just say there is a toolbox being used now to drive climate change forward, climate change uh, policy forward, which is not governmental. You know, it's not uh, uh, being driven by governments, it's being driven by NGOs, activists, lenders, banks, et cetera. Uh, and I'll leave it there and look forward to discussion. Thank you. Uh, before I open it for the questions from the audience, uh, can I ask whether the members of the panel have any comments they'd like to make uh, with regard to what each other has said or questions that they would like uh, to pose uh, for each other? If I could just follow up on that last point by Jody, which I think um, is a very important one and in fact ties in in some ways to this litigation, in particular, the um, Dutch Shell judgment. So unsurprisingly, um, there have been discussions about Shell, um, Shell's sense that this is essentially incompatible 
with its business and um, appealing the decision. Uh, but it's interesting to see where that decision is now turning up, for instance, in you know, advice to investors, KPMG is now talking about these cases in the context of ESG. Um, and there's also uh, follow-up litigation. So I gather there's a derivative shareholder action being brought in the UK or planned in the UK in relation to Shell, arguing that it's breaching its, the board's breaching its legal duties under the UK Companies Act, in part because of the way in which it's responding to the case in the Netherlands. So I think there's um, an interesting role being played by this litigation in kind of feeding into, uh, I guess, what some people have been calling a millennial investor its sensibility, where there's a real desire for a shift. And perhaps depressingly, it seems that the corporations are more attentive to the shareholder pressure than some states are to their citizenry, which is, I guess, how life is. Um, so the, the other question, I suppose, is then, as you said, Jody, what's the effect of targeting specific companies? And I mean, I've seen arguments about that also um, from an activist perspective saying there's a much bigger problem with the kind of structuring of this, the incentives to continue exploiting fossil fuels that can't be just addressed on a one-off basis, that there needs to be some kind of much broader settlement. The problem we face is reaching that settlement involves so many vested interests, such a lot of path dependence that it seems vanishingly, vanishingly difficult to imagine how that negotiation is, is going to get anywhere. And, and, and that's partly what stopped negotiations getting anywhere. And this is, I mean, fairly uncontroversial, I think, is the role that um, the, the relation of fossil fuel companies to some states has played in causing a, a kind of limitation to what can be negotiated. I think I'll just defer to let questions come and maybe fold some responses into responses to questions. I, I have a, a lot to say about what you just said and, and uh, it, it's a really interesting uh, topic. And, and I just wanna say, although I'm on the board of Conoco Phillips, everything I say is on my own behalf only, not on behalf of the board or the company, but having had the experience of being inside a boardroom, I think gives me a little bit different perspective than I would have otherwise. And there's a lot to say about what will and won't affect change and the role of the companies and whether individually suing the companies is uh, on balance the right strategy. And also there's a lot to say about the way the world depends on the current energy system. And there's a lot to say about the way that energy and geopolitics mix together and we need to be aware of that. Maybe in response to questions, we can dive into some of those harder, harder connections. May I briefly come in? Um, Please. In, in relation, thank you. Uh, I, I agree with uh, Jody uh, about some of the role that uh, litigation can play, even when the outcome uh, of the litigation is not what was actually expected. Uh, the, the, the petitioner's expectation might not be made. So when we say whether it's good or bad, it's also, re it, 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 it's also to a certain extent an issue of managing expectations. Now, we know of ca cases uh, in the past where uh, the decision uh, that was made uh, was not favorable uh, to the complainants, but it has actually spurred uh, further conversation. Uh, for instance, we can talk about a uh, decision from the Inter-American Court uh, where, uh, where hearings uh, were initiated uh, there, but the ult ultimately it was declared as inadmissible, uh, but then subsequently it actually spurred additional action uh, for additional hearings uh, or even political action. Uh, the second point is, uh, we, as, a, as the Committee on the Rights of the Child, when we actually uh, dealt with this case, we had no illusion whatsoever that whichever direction we went, uh, the ultimate uh, negative adverse comments could come. It was just a matter of which direction it was going to come. And ultimately, it was absolutely important for us to make sure that we had every I dotted and every T crossed. And we feel that we've actually done that. Whether a case that is coming to a treaty body uh, if it is actually well articulated and it has actually gone through the necessary percentage, it could definitely add value. 
But if it is not a case, if it is not really the right case to actually make significant pronouncements on the basis of the, the instrument that you have before you, then it will actually be very problematic. The third and final point that I want to mention is when we have these conversations about uh, litigations and, and the potential added value and so forth. One issue that we shouldn't forget uh, is the issue about reprisals. Why is it that quite, I mean, the number of reprisals in relation to uh, climate change activism and so forth, the majority of it happens uh, in, uh, in South America and secondly, uh, in Asia and so forth. Quite a lot of these cases at the domestic level that are actually coming up, they're actually being done uh, in the Western world because in the majority of those uh, countries that I just mentioned, the space is not even there. Uh, so uh, to even bring about those cases at the domestic sphere uh, in those circumstances, some of the countries do not have uh, freedom of information uh, legislation uh, in, in place. So uh, climate change litigation usually requires a higher level of access to information. In the majority of instances, it's the governments who actually have that uh, information. So uh, the added value of litigation should also be seen from the point of view of what it would actually mean uh, for reprisals, uh, which is obviously an issue that a number of uh, the special reporters at the Human Rights Council have had the opportunity to look at uh, in some detail. Thank you. Uh, while we're uh, talking about the, uh, the approach of the committee, uh, one of the questions uh, that came from the audience was a question, but some of the applicants in the Sashi case do not have standing at the respondent states. Uh, for example, applicants from Africa. Would that not fall within the exception of exhaustion uh, of local remedies? Um, could, you, could you say more about what the opportunities uh, for the kind of transboundary litigation uh, that the committee uh, is favoring are really would be uh, in national courts. Uh, yes, thank you very much. That, that's that's a very valid question, uh, and I did mention uh, in my uh, in my input that uh, sometimes the oral hearing uh, might actually be the make or break uh, scenario uh, in terms of uh, some of the issues that are actually being tested. That, that was an argument that was actually made by the petitioners, uh, but from the oral hearing, what actually transpired was that. Uh, for, for, for instance, there were arguments about class action, whether or not that would be uh, available. Uh, the state parties were able to, uh, to marshal evidence that that is actually available. Uh, in some circumstances, there were questions whether or not that will be unduly prolonged. But again, the, the details, uh, do unduly prolonged or, uh, or not, uh, the details were actually dependent on the case law. And there was evidence that was actually brought forward that actually showed that that was possible. And the same applied uh, for the issue about uh, you know, uh, state sovereignty uh, and whether or not some of the children uh, who are from uh, another country and whether they would have actually have uh, standing uh, before the countries that were uh, that were part of this petition. Uh, the majority of the evidence actually showed that there were case laws uh, and opportunities that they would actually have a standing uh, before the countries uh, that were the subject of uh, the, the communication. Uh, so as a result of that, we as a committee didn't actually feel that the petitioners were able to substantiate. As I said earlier, the burden shifts from the state to the petitioners when a certain evidence is actually brought to the attention of the committee. And from, from that process, uh, we were led to believe that the, that the argument that they wouldn't actually have a standing uh, was not well substantiated uh, by, uh, by the petitioners. Uh, so that's the reason why we ultimately end up in the direction that we uh, also uh, end up as far as exhaustion of local remedies is concerned. Thank you. Uh, another question we have uh, take, takes us away from the Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, uh, but keeps us at the international level. Uh, and that is a request to hear uh, the views of any of the panelists on the desirability of the United Nations Security Council legislating on the issue of climate change. Uh, for example, by framing climate change as a threat to international peace and security uh, and using Chapter 7 authority to oblige all member states to implement efforts uh, to meet specific emissions limits. Uh, I see uh, Professor Orford nodding, um, and I was thinking you might be the person most likely to answer this question. Yes, not nodding enthusiastically, but yes, nodding with an answer. Uh, so. Interestingly, of course, um, 
departments of defence and militaries have been way out ahead of other branches of government in seeing climate change as an existential question. So most, uh, we've seen a number of statements from the US uh, branches, for instance, the, a number of Australian defence chiefs have been talking about this. Uh, so there's no question that many, uh, that many are framing this as a security question and seeing this as a security question. Um, is it a good idea for the Security Council to have carriage of this? In my view, absolutely not. I realise that puts me with Russia, who voted yet to this uh, late <laughs> last year, um, which is perhaps not an ideal look at this point, but uh, it doesn't seem wise to me, uh, precisely because of the kind of impulses I've been in, uh, evidencing here already. I think these kind of political questions need to be negotiated fully and the Security Council is far from a, a representative body. Uh, indeed, the P5 are themselves uh, major emitters. Uh, so we know that um, the US is the major emitter per capita and, the, and China is the major emitter per se. And um, so to have the kind of major emitters legislating for everyone else in a sense seems unwise. Uh, but I really don't think within the UN that's the right place for this to be dealt with. And to the extent that there are significant, significant issues that we would characterize as related to security, they are related to broader questions of adaptation that should be dealt with really as a global issue rather than kind of turned into a security issue. So I realize this is very much on the agenda, but in terms of the way that the UN is structured, it doesn't seem to me that the Security Council is the right place to deal with this. Thank you. Um, staying with this question of uh, unequal distribution of power, uh, another question we have is, uh, with the use of human rights as a tool for climate change advocacy, are we going to see human rights imperialism? Uh, where the African countries and developing countries become the target of human rights cases to stop African development projects. Uh, yet those who have emitted the most in the global north refuse to commit on loss and damage and climate change fund. Uh, I ask this because the African countries have ratified the most human rights instruments and NGOs such as the Friends of Earth are targeting African countries and their projects such as South Africa and the Mozambique project. Uh, says the questioner. Uh, any thoughts in response to that question? Can I come in? Please. Thank you very much. Uh, now, the, the, the issue about uh, even the word climate apartheid has been thrown around uh, quite easily in relation to these uh, uh, issues. Um, it's the, the, the African countries. Um, we haven't really seen that sentiment that actually says that, uh, you know, if we don't actually get on the bandwagon, uh, that would be in our interest. We want to protect ourselves because, and so forth. The whole notion of climate apartheid has been mentioned in relation to loss and damage and the financing. And whether or not the countries that actually polluted the most, that actually grew uh, significantly in terms of their economies uh, in, in, in the past, yes, they should actually burden the majority of the weight. That's what I understand what common but differentiated actually means. It's not necessarily my area, but that's my understanding. But it's absolutely critical to also keep in mind that the human rights framework will help many African countries, whether it's through litigation, whether it's through advocacy. I'll just give two or three examples. As a result of the focus on biofuels in a number of countries the price of food has been increasing contributing to hunger in other parts of the world that would be addressed relatively better through a human rights framework uh, in a number of countries where forest preservations uh, have actually kicked in they have had implications for access to land uh, livelihood culture and so forth that would be better addressed through a human rights framework. Uh, we have seen it in the context of, uh, of the SDGs uh, and the MDGs as well. In the context of the MDGs, there was a push to actually achieve certain targets, for instance, uh, clearing out slums, which ultimately led to uh, an increase in countries of persons that are actually homeless. So for the African countries, uh, the human rights uh, 
focused climate activism, uh, the litigation and so forth, they would actually be a, a significant uh, add on in making sure that uh, those countries, uh, individuals can actually benefit from, uh, from, from the outcomes in relation to climate financing in relation to loss and damage, uh, in relation to uh, common but differentiated, there is inevitably a significant weight that needs to be uh, to, to be advanced so that those countries and the individuals living in those countries can actually benefit. Professor Freeman, does this question give you the opportunity to say some of the things you were holding uh, back to the question and answer period? Not in particular this one, I don't think, but I, I'll, I'll it's the find- closest you're, It's the closest you're going to get. Uh, well, uh, <laughs> I just don't want to misdirect. I, 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 guess, I guess what I would say is, as we think about these strategies, including human rights-based strategies, it, it, um, there are a lot of interconnecting issues here that I think it's important to be mindful about. I think one of the things Anne talked about is the idea of sort of benefits of targeting individual companies with litigation and such. And I guess one thing I've observed from my various vantage points is that um, we are not very good at having a conversation about short-term, medium-term, and long-term strategies at the same time and we're not very good about integrating climate policy with energy policy, which we do need to do. Um, it turns out, I mean, the war in Ukraine is a, is a tragic humanitarian disaster. And it's also illustrative of the way in which energy is connected to geopolitical power, the way that energy is a source of national power and a strategic strength. And the fact that one of the world's biggest oil producers, Russia is one of the top three oil producers is now being sanctioned. So the effort is to prevent it from, you know, uh, benefiting from its oil production to a certain extent. This requires in the short term, a need to satisfy the energy demands of Europe and to supplement the energy that they would have come, brought from Russia, it needs to come from other places. And so that conflict reminds us that there are short-term energy needs uh, that need to be satisfied and that will be satisfied largely with fossil fuels. And so there is a need to talk about how do we satisfy the world's dependence for the near term on fossil energy while planning for and executing the transition away from such a large share of fossil energy. And it's very hard to do those things uh, coherently at the same time. Um, the drive of capital out of the fossil fuel industry is a very popular strategy. I understand why. But you have to think about the implications of removing capital from the publicly accountable companies of the world, like the World Dutch Shells and the British Petroleum, and driving ownership into, say, the hands of private equity instead. By removing capital from the most publicly accountable and gas companies, you also may be having some impact on uh, that you haven't anticipated. So, I say these things because it's important to remember that the strategies have consequences that might not always serve the goal. If the goal is to produce more accountability for what oil and gas companies do, and if removing capital from the large integrated majors drives oil and gas into the hands of secretive private equity companies that aren't publicly accountable, we've done absolutely nothing to reduce emissions for the planet. We've not improved accountability. We haven't increased the voices of stakeholders in the decision-making process. So, you know, I, I, I just offer these reflections because from the perspective of these industries, they're thinking, we have a short-term need to satisfy the world's demand for oil and gas in a crisis like the one we are confronting in Ukraine. And they're thinking, boy, do people really want to drive capital away from us and let the authoritarian petrostates of the world supply the world's oil. None of that does anything for climate change. So I, I introduce this not because this is my own perspective. I'm introducing a perspective that ought to be taken into account 
in our conversations about strategies on advancing climate policy. The bottom line is the world governments need to do their job. They need to put a price on carbon in one form or another. They need to figure out a way to make commitments and obligations binding, I think perhaps by linking it to trade so that if you don't accomplish your commitments, perhaps you will be subject to border tariffs or whatever. There are regimes that can be adopted. And what's missing is the political will to do it. And when governments do their job, they will unleash the incentives with a carbon price or a series of instruments that will require massive investments in low carbon technologies because now it will be costly to produce fossil fuels. And so this is a, we need policy and we need government and private partnerships to emerge to create the trillions and trillions of dollars of capital needed to invest in a low carbon uh, energy system. And so, I, Human rights litigation, litigation writ large, is an important piece of the strategic puzzle, but there is a big picture here, and strategies need to be thought of in this larger context. Thank you. Uh, I think we can all agree that this is uh, an extremely complicated subject matter. Uh, and I'm deeply grateful uh, to the three panelists for helping us to understand it uh, somewhat better, uh, not as well as they do, but somewhat better. Uh, and thank you to uh, the audience uh, for being with us today. Thank you all.